Janice Smith back there in the blue stripes because she's the one that coordinated everything for us in New York. So if you need any help during the day, just find those guys or me and we will uh, try to help you get what you need. Uh, many other people at Consumers Union helped to put this together and uh, we appreciate all of their help. Uh, and just for uh, those of you who are uh, into uh, tweeting, we have a hashtag for this event. It's hashtag EndMedArm. So please uh, feel free to um, get on Twitter and tell people what's going on, on today. Uh, as uh, Chris said, uh, 10 years ago we started working on patient safety and one of the catalysts was this this uh, cover of Consumer Reports, that's an old cover from 2003, and uh, the cover article was written by Nancy Metcalf, who is, I think, in the room. There she is. Uh, and you might have read her things recently about health reform, but, um, but she, um, she was involved in that, and when we started, uh, that was one of the things, this, this, uh, this article, uh, uh, asked people who subscribed about their hospital experiences and uh, a significant number, I think it was 5%, said they had gotten an infection. And sure enough, that was the statistic pretty much that uh, the CDC had at that time. So uh, we are very excited about have, surviving 10 years, doing this work for 10 years, and feel like uh, we're getting some momentum, no, I uh, and I will talk to you more about that towards the end of the program. But today, you're going to hear about the issue of medical harm from the consumer and public interest voice, and from their perspective. It is a voice that's often left out of discussions when it comes to patient safety. Uh, pa a patient and consumer perspectives are included, but they're not the dominant perspective, and that's what you're going to see today. And as Chris said, joining you in the room today are consumer and patient advocates, many who came to this in the worst way by losing a loved one or surviving a hospital-acquired infection or a medical error. And when we started in 2003, these people started reaching out to us, and they come from all over the country, and they've connected to us one by one, state by state, Organization by organization, many of them started their own organizations and work on their own issues. But we, uh, one of the things that we've always done is we collect a lot of stories. Uh, on patient safety, we've collected over 6,000 stories. And the people in this room who are here today that I'm speaking of are extraordinary in that their experience with horrific and devastating events has propelled them to do something different than most people do when they're faced with this kind of situation. They have committed themselves to prevent similar events from happening to other people. They are self selflessly working so other people don't experience what they experience. Some of them have described it to me as it's something they have to do. They cannot not do it. It's the way they move through the world and uh, so they have to speak up. And that's, and that's what makes them stand out. This commitment has, has changed them. They've become respected experts and seasoned consumer advocates. They write books and they publish research and they serve on medical boards and nurse boards and advisory committees in the state and federal level. Um, they, uh, they serve on boards of major institutions of patient safety. They are a precious natural, national resource, not natural resource because what, what has emerged is not natural, it is extraordinary. Um, and together we have created a movement, movement to end secrecy and save lives. I hope that you can connect with some of them today and connect with us and join this movement uh, during the course of the day. And we really appreciate you being here. Uh, I have a couple of logistics. Bathrooms, clear at the end of the hall. Uh, lunch is going to be here around noon, um, and please join us for that. And please uh, silence your cell phones while you're in the room. Uh, and I think that's probably all the logistics. Contact, uh, find one of us if you have questions. And we'll just get started uh, a little bit early because I think our first panel is here. And I know that um, people always talk longer than we think they are, and 
uh, often, that's very good. So we're going to go ahead and start early and I, uh, ask the first panelists to come forward uh, and sit up here. Thank you very much for being here. This first panel uh, is uh, an extraordinary one with um, leaders, leading reporters, and people who are really working on trying to get information out to the public about patient safety, about the quality of our healthcare system, and um, they're truly the experts, and we're honored to have them here. Uh, you can read the bios. We're not going to spend a lot of time introducing people, uh, but you see by their name tags who they are, and I'll let you read the bios of of what they do, and um, they're going to talk a little bit about that also. Marshall Allen from ProPublica is going to moderate the panel, so I'll ask him to come up here right now. Thank you. Thank you. It really is an honor to be here, and it's uh, great to see uh, so many faces of so many people who have helped, I know, me with my uh, reporting, and I know the same is true for uh, Charlie and Pete and uh, John as well. So we uh, we could not do uh, what we do as journalists without uh, the informed perspectives that come from everyone in here in this room. So thank you. Uh, and it really is an honor to be here. I do want to introduce our our, uh, <clears throat> our guests briefly um, because we have a, a great panel here. Uh, Pete Eisler is a reporter, investigative reporter for USA Today. He's reported on a lot of topics, won a lot of awards in journalism, and he set his sights recently on uh, patient harm and patient safety problems and done some great stories on uh, problems like C. diff, uh, retained foreign objects, and many other things in the past year and a half. Uh, Charlie Ornstein is really an incredible innovator uh, when it comes to um, using data and reporting on healthcare. Um, he was really the driving force behind the hospitalinspections.org website, behind ProPublica's Nursing Home Inspect website, getting uh, inspection reports, getting them posted online and searchable in a usable format. He and his uh, colleague, um, uh, writing partner Tracy Weber, did the prescriber checkup, uh, ProPublica's pr prescriber checkup project is what they're doing now, and then they were also the driving forces behind the Dollars for Docs project at ProPublica, and he's had a, an illustrious journalism career before that. Um, and Dr. John Santa is uh, finding innovative ways at consumers, uh, consumer reports to take healthcare data, make it meaningful, provide facility uh, level accountability for providers. And uh, the Consumer Reports team is um, dropping multiple projects a year that are using data in uh, creative and innovative ways to help inform the public. Um, so thank you very much uh, to each of you, and we're looking forward to, um, to hearing from you. Uh, we're talking about uh, pulling back the curtain, translating patient safety data into usable public information. So um, the first thing, we're going to have each panelist talk for five minutes um, and give us an overview of how they've used healthcare data in their efforts to educate consumers. Uh, after that, I will uh, ask a few questions uh, that each of them will answer, and then we really want to have some time at the end for <coughs> questions from you all. Um, so let, let's get started um, with uh, Pete. Uh, we'll go first. Just tell us about how you've used healthcare data and information to educate the public. Okay, so um, for, for the past 18 months or so at USA Today, as Marshall mentioned, we've been producing a series of stories on risks to patient safety. Um, and we've relied very heavily on, on state and federal data to inform these stories and, um, you know, what we've found again and again is that we're not able to do with the data that's available what we would like to do. And I think that consumers, I think that, that, that really consumers run across the same frustration. Um, there, uh, you know, when you look at uh, government websites, uh, government data, and the way it's presented and the way that it's distributed, it's, it strikes me that it's more often set up to inform 
policymakers uh, and, and analysts than it is to inform consumers and to inform the public. And uh, and I think that that's that's an area where we can, we as a, as a nation could be doing a much much better job. There is a lot of good data out there, and, and these guys at ProPublica have done a great job of making a lot of it much more accessible than it is otherwise. Um, but that's still a problem. And then of course, you know, the the quality of the data itself and um, you know, where, where things land is the government is trying to balance the needs and the desires of the provider community with the needs and the desires of the consumer community. And I think oftentimes uh, that balance doesn't tilt enough towards the, the needs of consumers. Um, so very quickly I'll run through just a few things that we've done recently um, and, and, and sort of look at, at the things that we've done there. Um, so uh, we started our, our series, I can't see, okay, we started our series by, by looking at CDF, because uh, you know the federal initiative to combat HAIs. If you look at the data, CDF is, is certainly the one where they're making the least progress. Uh, arguably, no progress at all. Um, and um, what we did was we looked at the CDC's estimate, which is about 14,000 deaths a year, and we started looking at other data sets where we thought we might be able to get a, a more informed estimate on the scope of this problem. And what we ended up concluding uh, using hospital billing data from ARC was that the, the true number of deaths in the country annually from C. diff or people who die with a C. diff infection is really much closer to about 30,000. So roughly double what the CDC's official estimate is. And the number of cases uh, we found were about 500,000 cases a year of C. diff. Um, and when we ran these numbers by CDC, the response was, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, so, you know, this was just a case where, you know, you're looking at different data sets, different sources, and you can come to radically different conclusions about the scope of the problem. So I guess the lesson being, be very careful about accepting, even, even stuff that is sourced to federal data, about accepting that stuff on its face. Um, uh, we did a, a story on retained surgical items, uh, which, which really translates the overwhelming majority of the time into surgical sponges. Um, and, uh, you know, what we found on that was, uh, this time we, we found that the ARC data, the, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, which uses the hospital admissions, or the hospital billing data, was, was way off. And if you look at a lot of the academic studies and so forth that are being done, you know, ARC is estimating about 3,000 cases a year of retained surgical objects. Um, if, if, if you look at the studies and the other data sources out there, that it, it's, they suggest that that number is off by at least 50% uh, and probably close to half. Raise your hand if you've got <laughs> I, you. I know you were me. <laughs> um, uh, USA Today has this autoplay function, which is just a trick to get more clicks. And it's very annoying when you call up for a story on the website or can um, All right, so uh, one more minute. Uh, why don't we skip over state medical boards because I'm just going to give a nod to uh, Public Citizen, which really has done tremendous work on oversight of physicians. And, and we basically just copped a chapter out of their book and, and tweaked it around the edges. And, um, and uh, the most recent thing that we did was on nursing home trust funds. Nursing homes are required to maintain trust funds for their patients, uh, to safeguard their patient's savings if patients or residents, rather, uh, are unable or unwilling to manage their money themselves. Being in a nursing home, they can't get to... Uh, they can't get to the bank very often. And, and what we found there using uh, CMS data was just a huge number of citations each year where nursing homes are failing to pay interest on these funds or failing to manage them properly. And then using other data sets, looking at, at uh, you know, doing searches in legal databases and so forth, we focused on about 100 recent prosecutions and found that just thousands of nursing home residents had had their savings plundered while they were in these trust funds. Um, and with that one, we created a little tool to sort of help people use the, uh, the, the CMS uh, survey data. It's uh, frankly nothing nearly as robust as what ProPublica has done. But again, the goal being, you know, to help consumers find, to help present these, these data in a way that consumers can use it more readily. It's not quite so imposing. Um, so I will leave it at that. And, uh, Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Um, Charlie, tell us how you've used healthcare data. Absolutely.
So first, a shout out to Lisa. I've probably known Lisa more than any, longer than practically anybody in this room, and you guys are super lucky to have her. Uh, I, we met when I was at the Dallas Morning News uh, 15 years ago, and have stayed in close touch since, and she's just an amazing leader for us, so a shout out to her. Um, so I have a couple thoughts on health data to sort of set the tone here. The first is that public does not mean open, and the second is that transparent does not mean transparent. So when you hear these buzzwords, don't believe them. Because that's what we've found as we've sort of gone about doing our work. And it, it's sort of been a guiding principle for us as we've created tools for the public is not thinking about how some bureaucrat thinks you should use it, but actually, how do you want to use it? Like, and it's remarkable to think that one actually has to ask that question, but you do. So I want to show you three different projects I've been involved with. Two from ProPublica, one from the Association of Healthcare Journalists, uh, about how we've approached the topic of trans- How many people in this room have used the nursing home compare website that the CMS has online? It's very unfriendly. I suppose it's friendly if you know the exact name of the nursing home you want to go to and are willing to spend seven clicks to go through it. But even then, you really are not sure, how does this compare to others? Is this the worst in the state? Is this the best in the state? Uh, did you even know you can click around in there to find inspection reports from a facility? Um, it, it doesn't let you do things. What we try to do is allow you to both compare facilities within a state, but also compare your state to other states. So at the top of this page, you're able to see by state who finds the most, who suspends payment the most, who issues the most serious deficiencies per home. Would you believe that CMS gathers this data and doesn't look at it this way? As we talk to them, nobody, so they gather this stuff, they release this stuff, they don't look at this stuff. That is remarkable. So if you're looking at this, to me, you'd wanna know, why are certain states not issuing um, any serious deficiencies? So why is Virginia down here at 0.03 deficiencies per home, serious deficiencies per home? Shouldn't we care about that? Shouldn't somebody be raising a stink about it? Shouldn't you guys be caring about that? Shouldn't CMS be caring about that? Nobody cares about that. So on the one hand, we try to let you compare states to one another, which I think is really useful. Then another thing that we did is we also let you see which homes in the country have the most fines, right? You would never know that using CMS's site. Which homes in the country have the most serious deficiencies? And then by clicking on a state, you can compare these, the homes within the state to see what's actually going on there. So you can see within Texas, um, not to pick on Lisa State, but you can see by home where things compare to one another by total deficiencies, payment suspensions, serious deficiencies. Then when you click on a home, we try to make this intuitive, you can see the number of deficiencies they have and click right from here to read those deficiency reports. So we try to make it, take CMS where it allows you to compare three homes at one time. We want to let you compare anything you want in the way you want using the tools you want. The other thing we do with Nursing Home Inspect is we allow you to search the text of the Nursing Home Inspection Reports. So if one of you is particularly interested in a type of deficiency, for example, um, uh, MRSA, you can just go in here and type MRSA, and it will pull up all the inspection reports, 1,901 of them, that involve MRSA, and it will sort it by the level of severity. So you can now drill into this and find examples of things that you are concerned about and use those in your advocacy. This is an extraordinarily powerful tool and I encourage you to use it because the power of it I don't think has been unleashed quite yet and this room has the power to do that. So sort of modeled after this, the Association of Healthcare Journalists has created a tool called hospitalinspections.org. Has anybody used that tool? A few of you, but I would encourage the rest of you to go here because this attempts to do the same thing for hospital inspection reports as we did for nursing home reports. So I know a big focus of Consumers Union and the Safe Patient Project has been to get hospitals to release data on infection rates and stuff. But I firmly believe that the very best tool to report on the quality of a hospital is the inspection reports. When government inspectors go in, see with all the five of their senses what's actually going on and are writing about what's going wrong at, wrong at those facilities. For many years, you could file a freedom of information request to the government to get these reports gee, that's really friendly, and then wait weeks or months to get it back. Super useful if you're trying to uh, you know, navigate your own care. So the Association of Healthcare Journalists put pressure on the government for two years to release this in electronic format, which they finally did last year, or this year for the first time, and, and a pledge to update quarterly. And you can go in here and again, search by your state to see 
um, the hospitals in that state and how many have had problems and then read those reports. Um, you can also search by a keyword like MRSA or medication error or a favorite of mine is immediate jeopardy. Immediate jeopardy, for those of you who don't know, is the most serious deficiency that the government can issue against a hospital. It means they're putting patients' lives at risk as we speak. So if you go in here and put immediate jeopardy in quotes, you'll be able to see hospitals in your state that have been cited for immediate jeopardy and read about those conditions. Let me warn you that some of these are pretty graphic and horrible and terrible, and you should, if you have a weak stomach, don't, uh, don't immediately plunge into them. But this is serious stuff. And again, the reality of this, which is so shocking, is that just like nursing homes, the government hasn't looked at this. They didn't even know, for example, until we found that some of these uh, facilities did, uh, some states and some regions of the government were not uploading their deficiency reports into the federal government's computer system. So until they had produced a data run for us, they're like, wow, there's thousands of these reports that haven't been uploaded. uploaded. They don't look at this this way. They don't seem to, best, to find best practices based on this. They don't seek to disseminate this information. They don't seek to put it in consumers' hands. That's, so we've done this at the Association of Healthcare Journalists. We're committed to keeping this up to date, but you guys are the ones who have the power to use this and disseminate this information and report about this. And if you see, there's 79 reports in here involving immediate jeopardy, some of them pretty recently. If you see that stuff, read that stuff. That's transfusion errors, people giving transfusions with the wrong blood type and killing patients. That's examples of patients who are um, being not being treated and leave a hospital and then dying as they're leaving the hospital because they haven't been treated. You should care about this. If this is in your state where you're an advocate, you should be raising the public's attention to this. The final thing I'm gonna talk about, and I know this is just quick, but hopefully we'll have time to get into more of this during Q&A, is the project that we're in the midst of right now called Prescriber Checkup. Prescriber checkup for the very first time allows people to see the drugs that their doctors prescribe within Medicare. Medicare funds one out of every four drugs dispensed in this country. It is a huge payer. It covers seniors, it covers the disabled, 32 million people. You can look up your doctor now and see the drugs that they're prescribing, and we're about to update this in the next couple weeks to make it even more user-friendly. But if you take a doctor, like we profiled in our story, whose name is Enrique Casuso, and is in Miami, he's a psychiatrist. He prescribed 31,000 prescriptions in Medicare, which in and of itself doesn't mean very much. But the reason that you should care about Enrique Casuso is that he is prescribing tons and tons and tons of antipsychotics to seniors in assisted living facilities and nursing homes, and nobody is paying attention to him. So while CMS is making a big deal of cracking down on nursing homes for you know, giving antipsychotics to seniors, nobody's looking at what the doctors are doing. And if this is the doctor treating your mom, like it's great that CMS is making a big focus of this nationally and with nursing homes, but I care a lot more about the doctor treating my family member and this allows you to do that. And in our next iteration, you'll be able to see just the number of those that actually went to seniors. And we're gonna include some benchmarks that compare the doctor to their peers in a much easier way to see. So you should look at this, look up your doctors, see what drugs they're prescribing, see how they compare to their peers. See if they're prescribing drugs that their peers are not prescribing. You know, this empowers you both as a consumer, but also as an advocate to raise attention to issues that you care about. So I think that the, my main message here is that there's lots of data, there's lots of things that are supposedly public and transparent, but it's our job collectively as the media and as advocates to ensure that it actually is not just transparent, but useful. <coughs> useful to the public, <coughs> useful to the people who are using the healthcare system, because that's the most important group that is that needs to use this data. So thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Dr. Santa, tell us um, how you all are using data to inform the public. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's, it's terrific to um, be here. I always feel challenged because I think this is an audience that uh, um, frankly knows more and has done more um, about uh, safety than, than I have. So it's a privilege to be here. Um, it, it's great to uh, have it be here at Columbia. My wife works a couple of uh, blocks down the way, so I came in with her and um, trying to kind of think how I was going to express myself. And I thought, well, what better thing to do than go to a coffee house in, in the Columbia neighborhood and there's a Hungarian pastry coffee house a few blocks away. And um, uh, it has one of these great bathrooms uh, where there's graffiti on the wall, filled with graffiti. And um, I thought there, there certainly must be an inspiration here. And, uh, um, 
So there's a line on, on the wall that says there's three things you can't change. The past, the truth, and you. I looked at that and I thought, a doctor must have written that. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and this is an audience, I think, that would profoundly disagree with that. Because, um, of course, we know through the work of folks like you've just heard that the past isn't what we thought and the truth isn't what we've been told. Um, and that if we don't do something um, about it, uh, nobody will. Uh, well, um, at Consumer Reports, we've been very uh, actively involved in a variety of comparisons, and that's what we do well. Um, I thought what I would do is just show you a, a couple of examples of best and, and worst things that are going on. And, and this is the worst. Um, this is a full page ad of an organization that, that is rating um, doctors. It's their own doctors. Uh, now, this is a prestigious uh, organization. It's the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. It's a full-page ad that appeared in Spirit Magazine, the Southwest Airlines Magazine, in September 2013. Now, notice uh, the things that are underlined. This is about their laparoscopic surgeons. And actually, uh, um, I notice that they say their laparoscopic surgeons are the best. Um, I mean, you realize how much work we put into saying that word, and we say it rarely. Uh, well, they have 30 surgeons. They're all the best. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, public data, open data, any data that uh, could lead to that impression. And isn't it an incredible phenomenon that 30 of the best surgeons happen to be in Galveston, Texas? Um, this is the best. I'm sorry, this is the worst. The best. Next slide. Um, I think this is the future. Um, this is some ratings we did of physician groups in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, it's based on data um, uh, from an insurance company that, that I think is pretty truthful. It's an, a nonprofit insurance company in Minnesota, Health Partners, who has uh, devoted a lot of resources the last two decades to um, measurement. Um, so the first column is a quality column. It's 88 measures. There's actually 88 data points uh, in there about outcomes, about safety, about patient experience. So it's a composite. And in the usual consumer report style, we've indicated the high performers through a red, full red dot. Uh, of more significance is Health Partners has data on cost, which, let's face it, uh, while I think safety data is very motivating, when it comes to America, uh, what we're keeping track of is money. Uh, and ultimately, if we want to have a lot of impact on Americans, uh, we're going to uh, give them information about money. Um, and this is a comprehensive uh, cost measure that, again, uh, good is a full red dot. Uh, and so you can see who's good at quality and who has low costs. Uh, that's a five-site uh, family practice group at the top um, that uh, uh, was good at both. The third column tries to make this simple, which we know in research we need to do, because Americans actually, if you don't tell them uh, where good value is, they will assume it's where it's most costly. They assume more is better, they assume more expensive is better. And so here you actually tell them, no, uh, look at the best quality uh, is in a place that's actually uh, low cost. And there's a lot of good quality places, but they do that by spending a lot of money. Um, and ultimately, that's not going to work. Uh, they've got to figure out a better way uh, to do that. And so we've really been focused on trying to learn how to do this. And uh, we've presented ratings um, uh, in other areas, um, most lately health insurance plans that tries to present quality and cost. Next slide. Um, but the other world, of course, is what happens to us as individuals. And, and uh, I've uh, uh, shared this slide with this audience before. I uh, like uh, both the picture and the line. Um, I mean, this is the worst. Uh, the, the patient in an inferior position, the flappy gown, uh, the doctor um, standing up straight with the white coat, and look who's got um, all the information. Um, uh, this can't continue. And fortunately, next slide. Um, I personally, the most exciting thing for me this year has been to be involved with um, an initiative called Open Notes, where research from, researchers from Harvard um, uh, have shown how wonderful it is uh, when patients get access to the notes their doctors write. Not the lab tests, not the drugs they're prescribed, but the actual notes. 
We all deserve to have access to the actual notes. Many of us have practiced uh, in a way that tried to make those easily available, but on paper it's a challenge. Electronically, it's a flip of the switch. And next slide. Uh, Tom Del Banco and Jan Walker uh, basically did pilots in three systems in Seattle, Boston, um, and in Pennsylvania uh, for over a year involving hundreds of physicians, uh, tens of thousands of patients. Um, patients absolutely loved it. I mean, 99% uh, of patients after a year said, this is fantastic, I want to uh, uh, continue. Can you keep hitting that? To, um, uh, um, so um, they really wanted this to continue. What was interesting was they asked doctors the same question, next slide, and um, uh, the majority of physicians also liked uh, the pilot uh, and wanted to continue, but some did not. But when it came down to turning off the switch, not one of those physicians had the guts to turn off the switch. So everybody uh, continued uh, in the pilot. Today, multiple systems are adopting open notes. The Cleveland Clinic, MD Anderson, um, uh, the whole Geisinger uh, um, operation, um, uh, other folks uh, across the country. There's now over a million folks who have access to their notes, uh, uh, like in open notes. And I urge you to the degree you can, uh, push folks in your communities to give uh, patients access to the notes themselves. That's the data we all deserve uh, as individuals. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, so I'm going to ask a few questions here, and each panelist will uh, respond to the questions. Um, Gentlemen, one of the things that we really try and do when we do these uh, these stories or these projects is bring about change. And it can be so hard and difficult to see any results from any of the work that we do. And I know people in the room here can relate as well. Some of these seem like such intractable problems. But can you each maybe point to just one thing um, that you've done or a project that you've done where you saw some tangible um, change or reform come out of it or even public awareness? And then tell us, what, what do you think was the the key to making it effective? Um, well, one of the problems is we, not only that we want to see change, but the pace of that change. And often you'll see things take years or even decades before you can see the results of that project. I did a project back in the mid-90s where we looked at fire safety in nursing homes and we identified thousands and thousands of nursing homes around the country that didn't have sprinkler systems, for example, which is a particular problem in a setting where people can't get out of the building on their own. And we highlighted cases uh, in which uh, people had died in nursing home fires and, and used a, a bunch of CMS data to get onto this. I, I raised this because um, in the wake of that project, uh, Congress required and CMS complied by setting up a rule that would require all nursing homes in the country to have sprinkler systems. I think we did that project, I want to say that we did that in roughly 2005. Last month, that requirement took effect. <laughs> um, so do the math, seven years. Uh, they grandfathered facilities that were uh, they grandfathered facilities that were built before a certain time. The argument was that this requirement would push older nursing homes out of business and would create um, uh, a, a lack of uh, lack of services for people who needed places to be. Um, to my knowledge, here we are seven years later, and now all nursing homes have to have sprinkler systems. No one yet has brought to me, to my attention, a single case in which a nursing home went out of business because they had to install a sprinkler system. But it did take seven years, and I haven't gone back to figure out how many more nursing home fires have occurred in facilities that didn't have sprinklers since that time, but I suspect that if you wanted to go back and dissect that, you could figure it out. What do you think was the key to getting the attention of Congress? Uh, the key is out there. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, to a, to a certain extent, we can make noise and we can bang the drum in the newspaper uh, and 
in, in, in this case, you know, some of the fires were so horrific and we happened to do the, the project right after a spate of fires had killed, I think, dozens of people in nursing homes. Um, but really what made it happen was, uh, at that point, the, they were called the National Citizens Coalition for Nursing Home Reform. Now they're called the Consumer Voice uh, for Long-Term Care, I believe. Uh, they really pushed and pushed and pushed. So you had a few members of Congress that picked it up right away. They ordered, uh, I, I, I can't remember whether it was an IG report or a GAO report. Of course, that's many more months. And by the time those things come out, people have forgotten about the problem. But they just continued to push. And I think news, news organizations have a notoriously short attention span. Uh, so you know, when a story hits and it, and, it, and it clicks and you get some interest on the Hill, then really, I'm not gonna say it's the responsibility of the consumer advocate community because it really should be our responsibility as well, but as a practical matter, if the advocacy community doesn't take it up and really continue to push it, eventually it will go away. So I think that was the key, was in that, ca in that case, uh, a group or two just picking it up and just hammering on it uh, and repeatedly until something finally did get done. Great example, thank you. Um, Charlie, John? Uh, I want to give you two examples. One is a project that we did in 2009 um, in conjunction with the Los Angeles Times about the failures of the Board of Registered Nursing in California to oversee nurses in that state. Uh, and what we found was that nurses were able to go from hospital to hospital and continue harming people. And the Board of Registered Nursing essentially took an average of three years and five months to take disciplinary action against a nurse once a complaint came in and then enabled the nurses to keep working. Um, Fortunately, it's a sh little bit shorter tail than uh, Pete's in that uh, the next day, um, the governor fired the majority of the nursing board, and the day after that, the executive director of the nursing board resigned. Um, but the moral of that story is that long-term reforms that would have fixed some of the structural issues with the nursing home, with the nursing board, were killed by the unions that represent nurses in the state um, that lobby the legislature, not just to kill the bill, but to actually be silent in the room when the vote was taken so that there wouldn't be a quorum. So how horrible is that, right? But I think one of the lessons there is that the consumer community um, wasn't, just wasn't a factor in this at all. They didn't speak up about this, and so I think that partially enabled the killing of this bill. Um, the second is a story that we did about payments by uh, pharmaceutical companies to doctors, and one of the things that we did was we saw universities all across the country had put in place policies that prohibited their faculty from receiving this money, and it essentially adopted uh, the view that um, they would trust their faculty to do the right thing. And we probably could take a poll in this room on how many believe that policies in and of themselves work to uh, have people do the right thing. I'm not going to ask for hands, but suffice it to say that did not work at institutions like Stanford and Penn and Pitt and the University of Colorado. And in, in showing that, in fact, they had these policies but didn't enforce them, I think they were a wee bit embarrassed and are now actually checking to see whether their faculty, in fact, do adhere to the policies that they put in place. So I think that's another tangible benefit by, uh, in essence, naming and shaming. But um, the, the idea is that you, you can't just assume that even a policy fix that somebody says by putting in place you know, changing procedures is actually going to work. You actually then have to take it the next step to see if that actually did it or didn't. And so that's a lesson from that. Charlie, you mentioned uh, a term naming and shaming. What do you what do you mean by that? No, I think the idea is that um, in a lot of stories, you know, you can have sort of amorphous um, people who are responsible. But I think one of the things that we try to do is actually let readers and our our audience see who specifically is responsible and who specifically didn't do what they should do. And it's not sort of amorphous, but it's actually tangible with individuals' uh, names attached to it. Great example, thanks. Dr. Santa. Well, when I think back, I, I think um, um, the sequence of events that uh, Lisa and uh, Consumer, uh, Consumers Union and others have done around infections, it's, it's not just textbook, I think, on how to uh, um, make huge changes and um, the legislative changes that this group and others uh, um, uh, um, advocated for a decade ago led to the ability of uh, us being able to report um, enough uh, data on hospital acquired infections in 2010 um, uh, along with leapfrog data that was voluntary. Um, and on that day, uh, the Centers for Disease Control was the first federal agency to declare that they were in favor of public reporting of hospital-acquired infections. 
Um, and uh, it's a, it, it just amazed me. I didn't realize that all the other federal agencies were not. Um, uh, and some of them still haven't uh, been explicit about uh, um, favoring that. And, and, and so, you know, it, it continues. I was recently reading some Oregon information, and uh, um, now Oregon is uh, considering um, um, hospital-acquired infections to be in the realm of public health, and it's a public health problem, which it should. <laughs> You know, it, it should be treated in many respects like restaurant infections and, and uh, public health uh, uh, be able to enforce um, something on hospitals that are, are really terrible. So I think this whole sequence, and it, there's still a lot more to go, has been just textbook stuff um, that uh, uh, we need to learn from and, and do again and again and again. So uh, unpack that for us a little bit in terms of when you say textbook stuff or, or how this campaign went about, what were some of the, the key levers that were pushed that made it successful? Well, um, I, I think the public wasn't at all aware um, that infections were even a problem. Um, and so creating that awareness, um, uh, getting those first reports, getting the early adopters to uh, move forward, getting Peter Pronovost. Uh, to be more public. I mean, Pronovo's statement two years ago that uh, the third leading cause of death is uh, um, death from uh, safety problems in, in hospitals and healthcare. Um, uh, you know, you, you need all kinds of pieces um, and uh, in many respects a large team um, uh, or a virtual team to be moving those forward, but each of them makes a difference. Thank you. Great, great answers. Um, one of the biggest challenges uh, that I know we all face when we're trying to translate this data into information that people will be able to understand, um, I guess, I guess there, there are so many challenges. I'm wondering, Charlie, maybe you could start first, but what are the major challenges for you when you take something as complex as data and try and translate it for the public? I think there's two challenges. One is, um, this is complicated stuff. Um, how you measure things, how you track things, how you, uh, all the caveats, but it, it is incumbent upon us to take all of that complexity and to, while still being truthful to the caveats, to present it in a way that people can use. Because people do not have master's degrees in public health, and it's unfair to expect the audience to do that. And so you are the one, we are the ones, who have to sort of cut through that and put an honest perspective on that. The second thing, and I think this is cru crucially important, and I know, John, you think this too, is that People read reports all the time about medical journal studies and other things that they can't relate to personally. And you have to make it relatable to the person. They have to relate it to their personal situation, their doctor, their hospital, the nursing home their mom is in. And if it's just generally, it's hard to get, it's hard for people to care. You, I mean, people want that answer. It's, you know, it's great that you're saying that seniors across the country have, um, are getting bad drugs, but does my mom's doctor do that? You know, um, it's great that Dartmouth is saying that the New York region has the highest rate of, you know, whatever, you know, the highest spending on Medicare, but is my doctor practicing poorly? You know, regional variations are great for research discussions, but you actually, you have to, we have to bring it to the person where you buy into it. And I think what our Dollars for Docs tool did is, you know, we've had more than six million page views on it. People want to know whether their physician has a relationship with a pharmaceutical company. It is something that they can immediately grasp when it, when it goes to their caregivers. And so that sort of set the model for us in terms of how we go about these things. Charlie, why do you feel like that sort of specificity hasn't existed before? Well, the information hasn't necessarily existed before. And I mean, I think people are fine sharing information with researchers who will blind it and not share individual names. And we just don't agree to that. We will not agree to that. We want a name. Uh, we want you to be able to see it. We'll put the caveats on there, and we'll try to put the proper context around it. But we feel it's critically important that people can understand um, their caregivers and how these broader national trends you know, relate to them. Thank you. John, what, how would you answer that question? What are the major challenges you face when you try and translate data to the public? Well, um, getting it is, is a big part of the problem. And I think uh, uh, the system still controls most of the data and most of the best data. And uh, figuring out how to extract it from them um, through you know, public, private, cajoling, threatening, um, I, I think is uh, 
Um, uh, tricky. Tell us about those four methods, public, private, cajoling, and threatening. <laughs> so, well, you, what, do you, what do you mean? Well, I think uh, for folks who have uh, good data, like w we have a, um, a relationship with the Society for Thoracic Surgeons. I think everybody agrees they've spent 20 years accumulating uh, a great database of performance around heart surgery. Um, but they have been very reluctant to share it publicly. Um, actually, some organizations, I think, threatened them enough that they then were willing to release it voluntarily. And so that's the phase we're in. Um, but there's a still dance, still a dance going on because only 400 of the thousand heart surgery groups have released it. So how patient should we be? At some point should we say, the other 600 haven't, it's time to mandate them to report it. Um, you just keep moving them along. Uh, but there's enormous amounts of information in registries all throughout the system and only a tiny fraction of it is um, public. And, and they're publicly funded registries as well. Many of them are. Many of them are. Many of them are. And, and you know, one of the frustrating things is we're criticized for using claims data. Um, uh, I was reading the New York State Hospital Association's report today, and they say, well, there's much better um, clinical and medical record data available, and that's what should be used. Huh? <laughs> you know? They, they don't release that. That's not available to be used. Yeah, and they're not, they're not using it themselves a lot of times. Uh, Pete, what, what can you tell us about translating data for the public? Well, I look at I sort of look at the challenges as a three-legged stool, and we've we've talked about two of them. We've talked about the structure of the data, and we and you know, the fact that a lot of these databases that the government the data sets that the government maintains in particular are structured not to help consumers and not in a way that is consumer friendly or for that matter journalist friendly. Um, and then we have the problem with access, uh, you know, where. <laughs> Even you, you know, even as as poorly as some of those data sets are constructed, just getting them and getting access to them and getting full access to them can be very restrictive. And you have to, you know, oftentimes they will want you to 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 agree to all these caveats about how the data will be used. The the third part that that I've struggled with is the completeness or the lack of completeness of the data. The fact that um, you know, so for example, if we look at HAI reporting. We still have 15 states, the uh, last, last count that I looked at, 15 states have no HAI reporting requirement. And among those that do, some, several of them are voluntary and several others uh, anonymize the, the reporting data so that you can't, you know, you can see that there's a hospital out there that has really bad infection rates, but you can't figure out which hospital that is. And in fact, sometimes they will go to great lengths um, to, to make sure that you can't unravel that or unpack it. So I think that's the, that's the third thing is to look at the, is, is to be aware of what the limitations of the data are and to be able to, uh, to present those limitations in a way that people understand them and say, this, these, this is what you can draw and this is what you can't. And this is particularly a problem when you're looking to do the very thing that, that Charlie has been so effectively trying to help people do, which is compare across states, to compare facilities from state to state or to compare uh, reporting systems from state to state. So often the story is, in what, is as much in what you can't discern as it is in what you can discern. Thank you, folks. I want to. We have 30 minutes left in this uh, session. I want to leave plenty of time for your questions. So the way you'll signal to me that you're ready to ask a question is by coming to the microphone there in the middle of the room. Um, I'm going to ask another question here, uh, but I hope that some people will come and I'll call on you uh, after this question. So please, if you have questions uh, for the panel, um, come uh, to the microphone and we'll get started with questions after we talk here. Um, what would each of you say um, needs to happen to improve the accuracy and the completeness and the usefulness of the health data that we have available right now? Pete? <laughs> um, honestly, I'm not exactly sure what the best strategies are. For, I mean, I think that I think naming and shaming is is 
always an effective way to move forward. So, you know, if there are states that don't have an HAI reporting requirement to go back, I think that highlighting those states and making it clear that the people who live in those states don't have access to important information that could guide their healthcare decisions and their healthcare choices, and this is information that other states have chosen to provide and to make available to their to their to their citizenry, uh, I think is is a very important way to do it. So where the data are not complete, we need to say why, and we need to sort of hold feet to the fire. I think that the National Practitioner Data Bank is another good example um, of a data set that could be vastly more helpful to the public if it was made a little more open, a little more transparent. I understand the balance that, um, that the government is trying to strike with that, but I think that they've, my own opinion is that they've leaned far in the wrong direction. Um, so I think that, again, that's an instance where we just need to, every time we write about it, every time we talk about it, every time we, need, we reference it, we need to say, oh, and by the way, here's what you can't do, and here's why you can't do it, and here's the justification that's been provided, and here are some counter arguments to that. And I think that, that that's just something that we have to continue to push forward, both uh, you know, in the journalism world and in the advocacy community. I would say the best way to make sure that data is right is to make it public, right? Because people, if, they're, if it's, the data is private, they have no incentive to ensure that it's right because they can always just sort of, you know, there's no reason to correct it because nobody can see it. If you make it public, you will suddenly see people working really, really hard to make sure that their information is right. Why? Because they could look bad because of it. Now, some would argue that gives them an incentive to falsify the records or other things. My view on that is if somebody falsifies the records and they're caught, like, you can get in big trouble, right? So one of the arguments I hear from hospitals is, and public health departments is, we don't want to disclose, for example, um, a Legionnaire's outbreak within a hospital, because we don't want to scare, scare people, and we don't want to give hospitals an incentive not to report these. So my question is, isn't it the law that they report these? It's like, why do you need to give an incentive to report it? If they don't report it and you find out, right, you can find them and they can get in big trouble and you can publicize that. So why don't they use the tools at their discretion to ensure that hospitals know that there's an enforcement mechanism as opposed to sort of ignoring the law and just say, well, we need to work, you know, hand in hand. Like, these things should be public. And then if there are errors, those things will be corrected. Do you find this failure to enforce is a common thing that you... I think that there's experience. just this feeling of kumbaya and we're all in it together, but regulators have a role as regulators and healthcare institutions have a role as healthcare institutions to be regulated. And yes, they may have a common goal of reducing infections, but they each have different roles. And you know, regulators need to realize that their role is to enforce. And uh, I don't think many regulators see their role as that. Dr. Santa, what would you say needs to be done with data to make it more useful and accurate? Uh, making the data itself available and then putting it out there and uh, um, database folks uh, are going to do things with it uh, both in private public spheres and it's going to be messy um, and uh, some people are going to do well and some people are going to do terrible and people who cheat are going to be discovered some of them will get away with it and, you know uh, uh, that's uh, when things I think work best in our country I'll throw out a couple of my own uh, ideas here. Um, it, it greatly frustrates me the amount of data that's self-reported um, across the nation. And it, uh, a lot of studies show that self-reported data is not very accurate. And so it's self-reported and then it's not audited. And so um, that data could be uh, very easily audited, take a sample of it, uh, but that generally does not happen. So some of the systems that are set up like the National Healthcare Safety Network, for instance, which is what the CDC uses to gather data about hospital acquired infections, is all self-reported and it's not audited. And if you look at the NHSN website, they, they have some phrase on there um, that says something to the effect of, you know, we trust that, you know, this is being accurately reported. Um, so that would be one I would, I would point out. Uh, Please introduce yourself and then... Yeah, Steve Tower, Anchorage, Alaska, orthopedic surgeon. How do you take a different approach? I mean, there's been a big focus on complications and data. Now, what I find is an even more difficult question, how do you address overutilization? I mean, you can have a lot of procedures that are done with low complication rates, adds a lot of expense, 
but maybe weren't ideally indicated. And how do you, you know, I mean, how do you chew on that nut? Well, first I would say, uh, please give me a call uh, or let's talk after the session because I would like to talk to you about that. But gentlemen, does someone on the panel want to um, take that one? Yeah. Um, well, we've been fortunate, be, fortunate to be involved in this Choosing Wisely campaign, which is all about overuse. Um, and, and first of all, just you, you create in Americans an awareness that it exists. I mean, it's surprising how hard it is to convince people, albeit I live in New York, uh, that more is not better, um, that uh, you may not be getting the best health care uh, if you're in the place where uh, two or three times the number of caths and stents are being put in. Um, I think variation, you show people variation, that uh, uh, that is where variation can be useful. Wait a minute, why, why is it that in my community I'm much more likely to get this or that or much more unlikely uh, uh, what's going on? Um, and um, uh, you know, then you uh, look at really what's the evidence um, for the reasons these are being done. And we're certainly creating conversations through choosing wisely around uh, overuse all over the country. Uh, that's not to say that it won't take years, I think, um, uh, for our culture to change. I, I wanted to say one, one thing I found really funny and then uh, have an answer to the question. Uh, I don't know if many of you noticed that last week the stent doctors group decided to change the definition of um, stenting. And instead of using inappropriate, they which has been now turned against them by the feds, where they had certain situations in which they said it was inappropriate to put in a stent, and now they change it to like potentially may not be you know right and like so they're t so they've totally tempered all the names because it was used against them. So, but I think to take John's point further, people don't understand that if my community has a high rate of this, it's actually my doctor who's causing that. And I think getting that data out there, which hospitals are doing all of these spinal fusion procedures and which doctors at those hospitals are doing the spinal fusion procedures. And wait a minute, why is this community hospital in the middle of nowhere doing all these spinal fusion procedures? Oh, that's because of Dr. Smith. What's Dr. Smith doing? That's our job. That's your job to raise attention to like, this is Dr. Smith who's causing that. And we need to do a little, little looking into Dr. Smith here. And so I think it just has to go beyond the community weight and get that data out there. CMS started doing this with respect to the 100 top, you know, procedures and a lot of focus was given to the um, ch cost versus charges thing but one thing that hasn't gotten as much of focus is that they released as part of this in the summer the cost and charges data the volume indications and there's some pretty funky stuff in there if you look at some of the hospitals that are doing some of the procedures most often they're like little itty bitty community hospitals that should not be doing all of this stuff more often this is not the centers of excellence and so our job as reporters, so many reporters glommed onto the cost versus charges issue, which is pretty meaningless. But you can find a lot of utilization indicators in there at the hospital level that now need to be reported on. Um, one, one of the things that strikes me about this particular issue is the sort of deafening silence from the insurance industry. Um, and I'm talking about insurers, both private insurers and also Medicare for that matter, you know, which is a pretty big, good sized insurer itself. Um, you know, this is an area where the where the interests of consumers and the interests of the insurers really merge, and I think that there could be a, a, a much more effective work around that um, in terms of both identifying specific institutions where you know where overuse is a problem, and uh, you know there's some interesting Medicare data out there already, and you know of course we all you know stents is one of the things that we hear about a lot, but it, you know and, and spinal fusions, but it, but it's not just the, those areas, and I think that that uh, consumers union has done, done a good job looking at some of the testing and diagnostic, the overuse of some of the testing and diagnostic stuff, but uh, you know if. If in, in my perfect world someone was going to create an initiative around getting to that, they would figure out a way to get the insurers to share their information and to put it together in a useful way for the public because ultimately that would benefit the insurers as well. I've talked to insurance executives about that and what they told me is you know, they, they are concerned about maintaining their panel of providers so that people can have their doctor on the panel of providers and insurance companies can always just raise the rates. So I, 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 do, I know it's true. They have the data, they are in alignment, but really, at the end of the day, they can just charge more for premiums. I think premiums. it's one of those situations where everyone has to hold hands and jump into the yeah, pool at yeah, once, maybe you know? Right. You're That's not gonna get answer, one though. person to go out, well, you might, but you're not gonna get a, a lot of people to go out and do it on their own. Okay, we have another question. 
uh, introduce yourself, please, Alicia. Hi, I'm Alicia Cole, and I'm from uh, California. I'm on the HAI Advisory Committee in the state of California. And when you talk about incomplete data, and that you know, you mentioned that using fines for uh, hospitals that are non-compliant with the law. Well, one of the things that we're fighting really hard, both myself and Carol Moss and Ray Graylick, who are on the committee, is getting the the advisory committee to commit to fines. I mean, we can't even get that commitment. Um, you know, our data has been incomplete for quite some time. And I recently, well, last year, I did my own survey with uh, SurveyMonkey and sent it out to about you know 300 people and presented a document to the state that had charts and graphs and demographics on the usability of the website that we had and the fact that it wasn't and I got real data and real results and presented it and as a result yes we did go back and hire new people to come in and we're redesigning our website but in terms of how do you make that, you know, you guys are wonderful and the stories that you do are amazing, but they're huge exposés. Where do we get those small stories like that out there that the information is ineffective and this is what a survey of the general population thinks about that. You know, I'm trying to work on one of my goals for this year coming up is the fact that in the state of California, most citizens think that medical malpractice, medical malpractice judgments are on the medical board website. That's not so. So the, the, the question, I just want to uh, get the question answered is, um, where, where, where are outlets for getting these kinds of stories or these smaller stories the smaller out there? Smaller stories, yeah. not the larger Go ahead. exposés. So I think two things. One is, I think in California you have a model, Alicia, where how the legislature acted when it came to medical patient privacy breaches, which I covered back in 2008, in which there was a surge of hot snooping going on in hospitals, primarily dealing with celebrities, but where people were popping into people's records and taking a peek at them. The legislature passed pretty stiff fines of up to $50,000 per hospital if they uh, had breaches. The same thing should exist if they fail, your, fail to report infections. I think what's incumbent upon you guys is to find some examples of situations in which hospitals did not report the infections and bring those to light and ask how those are different from somebody being in somebody's medical record and trying to draw draw interest. But a hypothetical will never get as much interest as actual examples of. Well, it see, but we've we've been able to do that. But you have to realize, with that particular example, the governor's wife was one of the people who got snooped on. And so it made a difference. That legislation happened, boom, because his wife was affected by it. Let's, we, uh, I want to I want to move to the next question just because we have 15 minutes okay. left, and we can talk more about that afterward, okay. too. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, Jean Rexford. Um, we've done a lot of work on public reporting, and so our adverse event reports show up. And then I loved what you had to say, Pete. I'll show up one year, and I find that they change definitions. So now they'll say, well, you're comparing apples and oranges, which I've heard many times. But the, the real question I have is about billing data. Um, there is such complacency around the corruption in billing. And I don't know if anybody is really looking into that on a consistent level. Which corruption? What's what's the question uh, specifically? The question is, I mean, what do we do as as a group of people about the fraud that is in in hospital billing and physician billing? Yeah, we are looking into that, and we, I think we do have some data. And because uh, I completely agree with you, that the hospitals uh, tear apart administrative data, and the degree to which it's poor data, it's because it's fraudulent from them. They're misreporting, they're lying, stealing, um, uh, in order to maximize their their uh, uh, profits. Um, and Americans are just oblivious um, uh, to that. And uh, I think there's uh, some good potential for that. We'll see how what we can do with the information we have. Next question. Uh, hi, I'm John James, I'm from Houston. We've taken on a really daunting task here of going up against the medical industry in this country, which is huge. My question is primarily for Pete, 
but maybe others have something too. When you took on the nursing home industry and said, okay, you guys have got to have sprinklers in here, did you get pushback from them? And if so, how did you deal with it? Did you try to work with them or did you just go up against them and so on? How do you take on these big, entrenched, well-funded things that are going to pose what we want to do? I, I tend to gravitate towards consensus building more than confrontation. Um, probably an odd thing for an investigative reporter to say, but, um, you know, in that case, you know, to use that as a case study, the numbers were shocking. The notion that, you know, in the mid-2000s that you could have, I can't remember what the number of nursing homes out there was, but it was thousands of nursing homes that didn't have sprinkles. Um, it really was, was indefensible because, you know, the industry's comeback on that was, well, if you impose this requirement, it's going to drive all of these, it's going to drive all these facilities out of business because they're not going to be able to, to afford this. Um, ultimately, you know, I said to them, okay, so in your perfect world, do you, you know, first of all, do you agree that this is a problem? Well, yes, of course, they agree that it's a problem. People are dying in nursing homes and fires. There's not really any escaping that. Okay, so, you know, what do you think is the solution? Well, they think that the solution is for the government to to pay for nursing homes to put in sprinklers. Um, you know, and ultimately what emerged and was, a, you know, a low interest loan program to help facilities, uh, you know, cover these costs and defer the, and defer the, the impact over a number of years. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that I was responsible for that compromise being found. I wasn't. That was generated on the Hill. But what we can do is we can say, and, and you know, what I said to the industry was, okay, if you admit that there's a problem and you say that this is the path forward, that, that you see this is the path forward, um, at least we can have everybody admitting that there's a problem. And we can move the discussion to the next phase, which is what is the path forward and how do we find ways to get everyone on the same page and to find a way to get there that everybody can work with. And I think that that ultimately um, has, has been a model in, in, in a lot of the stuff that I've done, which is, you know, if you kind of shift the debate to what is the path forward and get everyone to sort of get on the same page that a problem exists, I think that that's the first step. Um, and especially when you're dealing with a powerful and entrenched lobby like the nursing home industry, so. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, Marshall. Uh, my name is Dave Antone. I'd like to address this question to Charlie. First of all, I'd like to make a statement. Um, I discovered a large cluster of patients injured at the Cleveland Clinic by one doctor about three years ago. And that investigation led to uh, learning the doctor was not board certified, was not credentialed, had many falsified credentials in his resume, um, and had injured lots of people. Uh, that led to six CMS investigations, uh, one finding the operating room fires uh, not reported, patients burned not reported, um, many, many safety violations. Um, imminent jeopardy, as you mentioned. Um, the entire uh, urology department was, uh, the staff and residents were not credentialed or certified or privileged to use the robotic da Vinci device. Now, um, uh, Bloomberg is now reporting on much of this due to the financial aspects of it with the investors. You know, I've, I've made the statement that investors have rights and patients don't. But to you, Charlie, my question is, I just went on and looked at your hospitalinspections.org site. There are six hospitals listed in Ohio. They're all small hospitals. Cleveland Clinic has been violated six times in three years by CMS surveys including imminent jeopardy, four in the past year and a half. None of those are on here. None of those are reported. So um, this is data that's coming from CMS. Uh, the hospital inspection system, just like the nursing home inspection system, if you were to figure out, um, try to pull people in a room today and say, how do you best do this? Um, I don't think anyone would ever arrive at the way things are done right now. Because there are parallel inspection systems, one at the state level, one at the federal level. They use the same forms, but they're under different rules. Sometimes the inspectors are going in with a CMS hat. Sometimes the same inspectors are going in with their state hat. They fill out a form and they give it to the hospital. It looks the exact same but it's under different sets of rules. So it could be that it's being issued under state of Ohio rules. It could be it's CMS rules, but CMS, it's not been uploaded into the system yet. 
uh, which could be a function of the CMS regional office that handles Ohio. I mean, so CMS clearly is aware as a result of now agreeing to make this stuff public that there are some flaws in the way that they're handling this and making this public. Those will be worked out, and I think to John's point, you have to sort of take the first step, right? If we were waiting for them to make sure the data was perfect before they released it, it would never be released. So I give them a lot of credit for saying, we're gonna make this public. So now, if there are specific examples that you wanna connect with me later of something where you feel that it is not on there, we can follow up with CMS and say, why isn't this on there? And they can research it. I think the goal of this is not to, it, the goal of hospital inspections is to, um, move this incrementally to a more public sphere. And so CMS is interested now that they've taken that huge leap, which took the permission of the administrator of CMS to release this in electronic format. I think if we can point out problems, they're committed to fixing them. So connect with me and we'll share that, those reports with them. And they are, I found, they will investigate it and try to determine why it's not publicly available. These were CMS investigations. So connect them, so just give them to me and yeah, I'll we'll, we'll them follow up with it afterward. Yeah, I'm happy to send it to the right people. Rosemary. Hi, I'm Rosemary Gibson. Um, I have two quick questions. One is, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal sued to have Part B Medicare data opened up and I understand they won that first level lawsuit. I don't know if there's any appeals going on. Um, Charlie, I, I love what you did with Part D and the prescribing patterns. Could you anticipate doing something like that for Part B Medicare data? That's the first question. So. Um, I think I'm going to take your first question before the first first question. Um, the status of it is uh, a court ruled that the injunction, which was a sort of a court order that prevented Medicare from releasing physician level payment and utilization data, it lifted the injunction, which uh, had stopped CMS from releasing it, and it was not appealed. So the injunction is lifted. Where that has now landed is that CMS sought over the summer comments from interested parties and in whether they should release this information. Uh, I'm sure it will come as a great surprise to those in this room that physician groups urge them not to do it because it would be misleading. Um, the Association of Healthcare Journalists, on the other hand, encourage them to release this information. Um, I suspect they will begin releasing some swaths of information, maybe not at the level of detail we hope, but I, I view this as in sort of the way John does. It does not have to be a grand slam from the beginning. Let's just start the release of data. We will, ProPublica or HCJ will work on, you know, making it in a usable format. But we just got to start down that line. And so I'm looking for CMS to make, a, even if it's a preliminary decision that we will just release certain aggregate bits of information, fine. Let's crack that door open. Let's start having data come out. And then we can keep pushing for more and more and more. So I do see that happening within the next year. Great. And second quick question. Um, more and more people in Medicare are going into Medicare Advantage plans, so we're not going to have claims data. So 27% of people are in Medicare Advantage now, so claims data are drying up. Is anybody thinking about a plan B for where we're going to get data as Medicare data becomes less representative of what's really going on? Medicare Advantage plans now have to report their data. Oh, so do. as part of Part D, that includes Medicare Advantage data. And I think they also have to report um, their data to, well, certainly when it comes to pharmaceuticals, and that's true for Medicaid, HMOs as well. I'm not sure if it involves, though, the actual physician claims. And how about the hospital level data? It does not and include infections? That. It does not, no. Yeah. So we're gonna be, have a resource that we've been using just dry up as more and more people quickly go into Medicare Advantage plans. I think it'd be great if we could have a dialogue at some point about what's gonna be the next generation data that's a good, source. That's a good point. Uh, just one quick mention, Rosemary. I mean, it, there are some um, allies. Uh, Kaiser, for example, is very frustrated that um, in our hospital ratings, we oftentimes don't have anything for them because of the phenomenon you uh, point out. They aren't reporting um, to uh, CMS in those databases. So some of the good uh, players out there may well... Are, they, um, are you talking with them? I mean, you bet, because they want, they want a good rating from uh, consumer reports. Hi, my name is Yanling Yu I'm from Seattle. Uh, I have a two quick questions. First is to Charlie, and I really uh, like your website about the uh, um, prescriber checkup. And my quick question is that it uh, seems like uh, most of the data, uh, the primary data source is... Uh, uh, yeah, step closer to the microphone. It uh, seems like uh, the primary data source for that is uh, Part B, uh, Part D, and I wonder if you have any plan to include any other data sources from you know other insurance company because there's uh, you know physician prescribed uh, drugs also 
been covered by other insurance company? So it's a great question. Uh, it's why prescriber checkup doesn't include data from private insurance companies. Um, and the answer to that is because the people who buy the data from the pharmacies, which are middlemen, sell it to the pharmaceutical industry and make tens or hundreds of millions of dollars doing that every year. And the pharmaceutical industry uses it to market their drugs to doctors. And those players don't have an interest in the public knowing mm -hmm. about the drugs their doctors prescribe because it's used as a marketing tool. Mm -hmm. And so we've requested this information and have been told no. My editor even authorized me to say, name your price. We will fundraise the money to buy it. And we were told under no circumstances. Yeah, thank you. My, my second question is that, you know, I'm a member on the uh, Washington State uh, Hospital Acquired Infection Committee, and I'm very interested to make a data, uh, infection data uh, being public, and I appreciate all you're doing. And uh, my question is that, uh, do you have any plan to make some type of uh, article investigation to make comparison among different states? Uh, their public infection data and see how they, uh, you know, uh, more be useful to the public and, and, and how transparency. Well, I mean, we have some things in the works uh, that are somewhat related to infections. Um, the, the hard thing is to know if it's self-reported data and it's not audited, it becomes really difficult to make meaningful comparisons between any facilities or any states. So I'm always very reticent and cautious about making comparisons when the data is that, uh, you know, inconsistent. Um, but we could, we could talk more about it. I'd love to hear what you're doing to push for that in Washington. Yeah, okay, thanks. I think that uh, just, you know, one thing that I would add, you know, this gets back to this, uh, you know, sometimes you don't have to go for the, for the big story. Sometimes, you know, the story might just be, comparing and contrasting what different states are doing on that front in terms of reporting and you know then we get back to the naming and shaming thing you know if you're one of the dwindling number of states that are not helping to make this information public in a way that's useful to consumers um, I think that that's something that you know that cries out for either a newspaper report or uh, you know, this, uh, some organization in the patient advocacy community to go out there and to do a, a 50 state analysis or review and to do the, that comparing and contrasting. Hi, I'm Carol Moss with Niles Project. Hi, Charlie. Uh, we worked with the Consumers Union on Niles Law in the state of California requiring all California hospitals to report infections and implement uh, preventive measures. Um, my question has to do with what you just talked about today. Once you um, once you uh, define that there is a problem and, there, and you admit that there's a problem, um, the recent announcement of the NFL um, finally admitting to the world all of the harm that's been taking place um, across the world and within the NFL, um, they finally disclosed that you know, as of right now, there's 32 teams that are being affected by MRSA infections and really dramatically affecting uh, so many people. And this has been going on for years. Um, has any, have any of you picked up the story that the NFL has now stated that they will no longer be installing um, AstroTurf for their, their next fields that they build, um, pretty much admitting that much, a lot of this harm is coming from what they get from Monsanto. Um, it's, I think it's a huge story. I've heard from some of the NFL people that the only way that it's safe is if you clean the AstroTurf every other week. Um, and where this is being laid in high schools, they don't have $22,000 every other week to clean it. So just wondering if any of you are picking up that story. It is touching all of us today. I, I, I didn't know about that, but that sounds like a good story. That sounds like a good right, story. Thanks. I didn't know about it either. And considering that the, re the very reason that high schools are putting in those fields is to save money, it doesn't strike me that they're going to be uh, spending extra to keep them clean. Um, hi, uh, Dee Dee Vallier from Oregon. Um, we only have two newspapers in our state, roughly speaking, and we've come up against the challenge of the influence of the advertisers. So how do you get your story out there with the papers when the advertisers are basically threatening them? This has happened before um, when reporters have covered hospitals where there's a classic example in Hackensack where the, um, the hospital ordered the gift shop not to 
um, sell the newspaper anymore and plucked its ads from the paper. Then that backfired nationally and got national stories that caused the hospital to relent. So I think if you actually have the goods, you know, like evidence that the hospital has done this, then you go to a national outlet and show, you know, you try to draw, if the local papers are conflicted out, then you draw attention to the conflict by going to a national outfit. You can, I'll give you my card and we can okay. strategize about it. But I think there are ways of drawing attention to if that actually is happening, then everybody's gonna come out embarrassed in the process. So it deserves to come out. Well, I know of a gentleman, this was my theory quite a while back and, um, I just recently, about a year ago, heard of a gentleman who did leave the Oregonian and is now at um, the Department of Health who did tell a copywriter that that was happening, but you know, is his job in retirement in jeopardy if he speaks out? And so, it, that, uh, is yeah. electronic, is there electronic? There are other media too. I mean, there's Oregon Public Radio, which you can go to to you know raise the issue, and they have good health reporters who, who could be interested in that. TV, you know, is much less dependent on, um, you know, ads from the hospitals. Although they're not all, some have partnerships with hospitals. Yeah. But well, and it, what, I didn't even think it was just the hospitals. I think it's also pharmaceutical and the insurance companies all kind of supporting each other. So. One, one thing that's also uh, powerful in the internet era is the democratization of the media where anybody really can write about anything and you don't need the mainstream media to cover your story to validate it right. anymore. Um, and so, um, you know, I encourage people to start your own online presence, you know, try and, uh, you know, have, have standards, you know, it's a skill that needs to be acquired, so you'll have to grow and improve and find other, maybe journalists to even help you um, with your communicating and your uh, storytelling. But, you know, you can create your own online platform uh, using social media, Twitter and Facebook as well, and you can start telling these stories yourselves. And so, no longer are people dependent on the media to have a voice, and I think that's a powerful thing. And, 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 and just a word, I mean, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about media. In their defense, um, you know, you name names, you have to be prepared for the consequences, and, and they have to be prepared with you, meaning they have to give time to the other folks. They have to fact check it. They have to do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, media and journalists are struggling, and a lot of uh, places just don't have the resources to take on that kind of risk. Yeah, my own personal experience has been far more often the reason stories don't get covered is because there simply aren't enough reporters or yeah. there isn't enough money mm -hmm. to cover those stories. Um, you know, if there, if there are local papers that you think are not covering something because of pressure from advertisers, and um, I, I, I think that if you could make that case in an effective way and if you could show it and demonstrate it, there are any number of other media outlets and, you know, there are these sort of, uh, you know, these models popping up of, of uh, publicly funded investigative reporting outfits all around that would, that would be another place to look for that. Um, but I'd, I'd want to be sure that the real reason that they, were that they weren't covering it wasn't just because it's not a priority for them. Yeah, and I mean, I just one more quick point, and that is, um, obviously everybody thinks that their story is the most important. And so it could well be that it just, in the scheme of things, isn't. And that's where you can call one of us and sort of have a fact, you know, like sort of a check, reality check is, is what I'm looking at, you know, should it be being covered or is it something that, you know, in the scheme of things just doesn't rise up and we'll give you an honest answer on that. Thank you everyone, thank you panelists. Thank you, sorry, we're, we're gonna have to cut it off. Sorry, Kathy. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you all and thanks for this great panel. It was